What's going on guys? Waco from Revolution here with two legends of the watch industry. Over here I have Eric Koo, owner of Vintage Rolex Forums, co-founder of Loop This, probably the most knowledgeable guy about all things vintage in the world. And I have here Silas Walton, the founder of A Collective Man, probably my favorite journalism site. And yes, I said journalism because he was the guy that merged exquisite storytelling with incredible commercial vision to create something completely unique. And I love these two guys, but I wanted you to hang out with these two guys because these are the guys that are shaping the watch market today. So let's first do a quick wrist check. Silas, what you got on your wrist? Uh, Recep, Recepi CC1. Nice. It's, that is what I like to call a me undies go tight kind of watch. Absolutely. I see that and my undies get really tight. <laughs> and Eric, who? What are you wearing? Uh, I'm wearing my Don't Rob Me in Europe Baltic watch. <laughs> Um, I take it you're going to one of the European capitals after this. Possibly. Yes. Well, I was in Paris um, and I had that exact same watch the entire time and I was very yeah. happy that I did not get robbed. Looks pretty good and you won't get robbed hopefully. Absolutely. So gentlemen, first question, what the hell is going on with the watch industry? Why has this become everyone's favorite hobby? Is it because these things are now appreciable assets? Eric, what's going on, dude? You know, I think it's a confluence of a lot of things. Uh, over COVID, we all had a lot of time with not much to do. So, uh, like most people, I think I was just looking at cool shit to buy on the internet and a lot of people found watches that didn't know about it already. But it seems like a whole hell of a lot of people found them, right? Yes. And you know, it, was, it used to be like this wonderfully charming kind of nerdy insular hobby, mm. right? We used to be kind of identify each other as like, you know, kind of watch nerds or geeks. And now it's become like every hype guy with a cool sports car that's an athlete or a movie star, they all want to be in our domain now. What's going on? Silas, how do you feel about this? Uh, look, I think that, um you know, five, six, seven, eight years ago, it was definitely a much more kind of um, collector niche kind of space. It wasn't as big, it wasn't as uh, sexy and active. And then in the last two, three years, between the sort of access to new information, everything that's happening in the auction space, all the new emerging players, just loop this, um, all the exciting things have kind of pushed people. And then you add the COVID element, as, as Eric referenced, and suddenly you have, you know, a bit of a you know, an impressive uh, little sort of mini phenomena. Unprecedented run up of uh, appreciable assets in general, mm. Bitcoin going up, coming down, whatever, all <laughs> these things, I think kind of added to uh, the idea that there was a lot of like uh, excess capital out there that people either wanted to spend or invest, depending on how you look at it. I, you know, I, I was going to see my ear, nose and throat doctor and as he was sticking a camera up my nose, he started like asking me about watches. And it seems like everyone is coming out of like, you know, the, the woodwork now to ask about watches and wants mm. to participate in this. Mm. What is the one piece of advice that you would give someone wanting to buy a watch that may potentially appreciate? I mean, I think this is a really, really cliched thing that all of us have said over and over again, but it's, you have to buy something you like, you know, um, if these things go down to zero, there's still like cool things that you wear and, you know, a uh, type of a fashion accessory. So it has to be something that you like, you know. Do your research, read, read and read again. And, and don't go for the sort of uh, short attention span kind of, you know, clip things, read the long form. Okay, that's what I want to get to. And the reason why I wanted to have both of you guys here together is I think you guys specialize in identifying the very best. And a lot of times the very best is not obvious. A lot of times the very best takes some sort of foraging and digging, you know? Mm -hmm. if, if you guys were going to be dogs, your breed would be Legato Romagnolo, <laughs> which is the breed of dog that hunts truffles. truffles. Hunters. Exactly, yeah. right? Yeah. And this is what these guys do. I mean, you were there way before anyone else with so much of the stuff, especially championing, you know, for example, Dufour. And I think mm -hmm. you still have the highest pay, pay, price paid for a Dufour Sonnery. Uh, of all time, right? Yeah, um, for now. And, and yeah. So tell us a little bit about how you have imparted your individual taste from vintage Roger Dubuis to Philippe Dufour to Kari Butelainen to um, uh, original brass movement uh, Jorns and taking that and imparted it to a wider audience. So, so I, I think to an extent it's what Eric said. You know, I, I kind of, we went after, I went after what I liked. And I think initially it would take a while to figure that out. And, and then you start to see stories, design language, design codes that sort of crossover uh, periods, both vintage, neo-vintage, modern, um, and you end up gravitating towards pockets and you end up particularly gravitating towards things that you feel are underappreciated because somehow it's cool. There's that kind of contrarian aspect that I think is very motivating. Um, but it was inevitable, absolutely inevitable, that, for example, Dufour or Roger or um, Kyrgyz Leinen or Recep or others in the independent space would absolutely have their day. It was just a matter of when, not if. 
You know, you know, I, I, oftentimes Tyler, the creator, is credited as making Cartier popular, but in fact, that's not true. I know it's actually you. <laughs> so tell me what it was about Cartier that you saw that no one else saw, and how did you get there before everyone else? And then how did you convince everyone to buy them, including me? I mean, I am, I think, one of the most, I don't even know if I can say overlooked or whatever, but people that collect watches really get um, caught up in, you know, like in-house movements, like, uh, you know, uh, tourbillons, complications things of that matter. But at the end of the day, to me, watch ultimately is like a, it's a fashion accessory or an expression of like your individual tastes. And, um, you know, Cartier has always had like the strongest design language for me, you know? Um, you look at the really early pieces, like tanks are a hundred plus years old right now. And that the fact that the same design is still relevant now, I think is really uh, a testament to the timelessness of these watches. And, you know, I just, I always love these. Uh, I remember looking at uh, old Cartier catalogs in the 1980s, you know, uh, in a red envelope with little parchment pages and gold foil on them. I think the Cartier design language is really strong and I just, you know, really love their designs from a long time ago. Okay, so let me ask you this, right? I mean, the, the, it, you, a watch cannot be an asset if there isn't really a vibrant secondary market for it, right? Do you guys feel this secondary market is where the excitement is right now? And do you feel it's being manipulated in some ways? Or do you think the good stuff is just coming to, to the top? I think it's a confluence of everything that you mentioned. Um, you know, I know for me, when I started collecting Cartier, for example, um, things were very cheap. I mean, um, you know, thanks to a collected man doing these very uh, detailed tutorials and, you know, uh, stories and ed editorial about all these like really great kind of underappreciated things. Uh, Cartier CPCP, for example. I mean, these watches, I, I was looking, I bought the 90s, like uh, anniversary cinch rays for 11, 12,000. Wow. Um, the platinum ones were always uh, 18 to 20,000. Wow. Um, I was buying like tank normals for three to $4,000. That's crazy. And you know, these things like, Right now, they're five x those prices. Yeah, I know? think the last gold one I saw, a uh, full set tank scene from the nineties, was like a, like a hundred and twenty, hundred fifty grand yeah. something like that. So it's nuts, you know. I mean, it, it's just I think, you know, right now we're living in a world where information and deep information is so readily available at any given time that it really. Uh, I know maybe you were planning to ask both of us, but I know people always ask like, what's the next thing? It's really hard to say right now because. Mm -hmm. The information is all out there, and I feel like there's nothing really kind of left to be discovered, to be honest. <laughs> it seems like Daniel Roth is making, a, you know, a, a big push. You yes. Know? But, yeah. you know, what's interesting, actually, is like um, I really like the early era uh, Shumway Brothers Brigade Daniel Roth stuff as well. Sure. And that stuff is still super cheap, right? Yeah, very undervalued. Yeah. Uh, very cool DNA, uh, really cool movements. But the really uh, cool ones are already, like, kind of difficult to find. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. definitely. Yeah. Silas, you know, for you, right, I mean, you, you have actually, as, as Eric correctly put it, created some of the best articles in the world. I think your Tonk Century article was one that I heavily plagiarized from. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. Uh, but it was yeah. also, you know, a phenomenal article. Why did you feel from the beginning that like, okay, listen, I want to sell watches, but I also want to create the greatest body of written knowledge here as well, you know? So, yeah, uh, it's very kind of you to say that. I, I think that um, as far as the marriage of uh, carefully researched editorial with e-commerce, uh, is concerned, there was almost an inevitability to it in the sense that um, the only, the way I always looked at it was if I'm, if I have an e-commerce business, uh, everyone knows exactly what it is. It's very clear. There's no ambiguity. It's an e-commerce business. We sell products for a profit. And therefore, ultimately, I can do, you know, there, there's only, I can only improve on that brand image. I can only take off the corners. I can only polish it by adding some sort of value to the proposition. And so whether it was curation, whether it was an, a nice website, whether it was you know, a good Instagram feed, at a certain point, it became clear that there was, it wasn't as much of an issue in terms of legitimacy to be potentially writing detailed guides and detailed articles, long form articles about things that we were selling. As long as it was super clear that we were writing about the stuff we loved, we sell the stuff we loved, and ultimately, it's up to the consumers to decide whether or not they think it's credible. Um, and the more factually led that research is, the, you know, and especially today's world where everything is shared and ultimately can, you can poke holes in something within seconds you know, on social media, 
um, that content will either stand or fall by itself. I totally agree, and you know, this may be a somewhat contrarian perspective, and people oftentimes say, you know, but what's up with it when you know people take positions in certain watches and then talk about them or create a body of knowledge around them and, and cause the prices to ascend? Well, I mean, that's exactly how the vintage car market works. That's exactly how art has always functioned, right? And I think that as long as that body of knowledge is, is super authentic and is super legitimate, then there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And may I also propose that if something isn't genuinely good to begin with, you can't do it. No, no, absolutely. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like people sometimes critique, um, you know, just so Justin Reyes, who's the CEO of Watchbox, is joining us. And, uh, and you know, they, they've been critiqued as saying, having taken positions in certain brands, right? Uh, and, and pushing up the values of it. But the point is, if those watches were not genuinely good, yeah. no one would buy them, right? Yeah, yeah totally. You know, yeah. okay, question. Um, so let's talk about, you know, your Richard Mill 1103s, your paddocks with the green dials, your paddocks with the Tiffany blue dials. Let's talk about, you know, 16202s. What is the phenomenal, so what to you is a hype watch and how would you distinguish if you do between that and something that you, ha you feel has you know, super long everlasting value? Well, I suppose there's the, the broad category, which is really just the references that you've, you've referred to. So like Daytona's, Northless's, you know, your Royal Oaks, your, um, you know, to an extent certain other brands and certain hype references overseas, etc. cetera. Um, but that's a very broad swathe, very broad church. Um, anything where the demand so significantly exceeds the price that you know you see the secondary market value dramatically grow up, you know to an extent that's a hype watch, you know to, within certain parameters. And then you have obviously the the kind of tier above, which is the ultra hype watches where there are only you know 150 made or whatever with a Tiffany blue dial or you know the the green dial Nautilus or um, other ultra rare versions of the AP Rolex petrol calendar, for example, um, and those sorts of things, you know, they're in a league of their own, but it's, it's not my area of specialty, yes. but you know, there are market dynamics there that make sense and they're very comparable, I think, to other markets as well. But I've always liked the fact that rather than focusing on that, and incidentally, nothing but huge respect to all those brands, like Richard yeah, is one of my favorite brands, yeah. you know? Um, but because it is the kind of watch that people who are getting into watches and have a lot of money first kind of like, you know, meet and see on their friends' wrists yeah. and then they want and are willing to pay a premium for, I like the fact that you and also you, Eric, have always focused on the stuff that is more educational based, right? That is actually genuinely rare, especially the independence as well. And that is, is you know, truly innovative and, and incredibly expressive, right? Yeah. Like you're talking about Rexep, you know, you were talking about Roger Smith, which mm. I also know, I think you set a record for a Roger Smith watch as well. When you, Once you know, upon a time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, Eric, for you, is this a healthy thing or do you despise it? You know, the market is what the market is. Uh, none of us can really be the, uh, the shepherd of that. It's kind of its own beast. But you know, with all these models that are like really hyped, like I think of the top three, obviously, it's gonna be Daytona, Royal Oak, Nautilus. These are watches that have been made each for like 50 plus years right now, you know, with the Royal Oak celebrating its 50th anniversary. And there are a lot of like really great examples of these watches that are like discontinued models, vintage ones or whatever, that look, they've all gone up in price, but you know, to me, if I look at a, 5711 and whatever comes next, 6711, right. 5811, whatever it ends up being, um, you know, a 3700 is like marginally more expensive than a 5711. Yeah, to me, it's like yeah. a much more interesting watch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, me too. Uh, the I same mean, thing with like a Royal Oak, like yeah. a 5402, yeah. you know, all these yeah. type of things. Yeah. And so there's a lot out there, you know, there's midsize, there's small size, yes. there's quartz, there's, yeah. you know, automatic, manual wine, whatever, yeah. all sorts of variations of these. Yeah. yeah, it's funny that you say that. And I'm, I'm very pleased that you said that because I happen to have a 3701A. And yep. uh, also have a 5402, and I've been. I was like, why the hell are these things not rising at the same rate? Mm, yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. but but potentially now that you've told everyone to go buy one, they, they will. <laughs> thank you very much, Eric. I'm very happy. Okay, so uh, I want to sum up the, like like this. I mean, so if you talk about all the luxury watches that are made, I mean the luxury watches, right? Maybe two and a half million watches per year, or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that's actually about the production of just one major car manufacturer, right? So if everyone that wants a nice car wants now a nice watch, a luxury watch, the delta between supply and demand is insurmountable, mm. right? Is there any way we can put the genie back in the bottle, or are we basically screwed now? It's going to be the reality for the, you know for the future. I think it's like Eric said, you know, you can't control the market. At a certain point, it just progresses. And we've probably reached a point where it's acquired its own escape velocity. Um, I think that, um, you know, the manufacturers will continue to increase production like incrementally, but the demand is always gonna like outpace the, uh, 
the uh, increase in production. So, you know, in absolute terms, I think things will feel like harder to get than, you know. I mean, I can't think of a time in, <laughs> in I can't think of a time in uh, watch history where a brand is actually like, hey, we cut like fifty percent production, <laughs> unless they're going through like some financial disastrous yes. thing or yes. changing their image. But like mm. generally, it's like you know, Rolex or whatever, they're yes. never going to be like, oh, we decided to make like, you know, 800,000 watches instead of 1.6 million yeah. or something. Yeah. But at the same time, yeah. you know, when I tell young people, yeah, you know, back in the day, you could just walk into a store and be like, can I take a look at that Seedweiler versus the Submariner? And they, they look at me like I'm high, yeah. you know, like, uh, and, and I guess that is a testament to how wonderful those watches are and how many people are aware of them now. Okay, I know I said I wouldn't do this, and I know you, you guys said, oh, everyone asks this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Silas. Inside scoop. Uh, probably only Parmigiani or early Dude, Frankfurter. I totally agree with that big time. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go with a, uh, a different thing. Um, but basically, the steel bezel Rolex movement Daytona is like the 116520. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. They made a lot of them, but there's still like a Daytona. Yeah. And I think they are quite reasonably priced right now. Mm. Gentlemen, I thank you for your time, for your patience with me, and my incompetent questions. I appreciate it. Sir, pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Peace, guys.